And now our reading from the Old Testament. The reading is from the book of Ezekiel, chapter 37, verses 1 through 14. That can be found on pages 678 and 679 of your pew Bibles. Listen to the word of God. The hand of the Lord was upon me, and he brought me out in the spirit of the Lord and sent, set me down in the middle of the valley. It was full of bones. And he led me around among them, and behold, there were very many on the surface of the valley, and behold, they were very dry. And he said to me, Son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, O Lord God, you know. Then he said to me, Prophesy over these bones and say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, Behold, I will cause breath to enter you, and you shall live. And I will lay sinews upon you, and will cause flesh to come upon you, and cover you with skin, and put breath in you, and you shall live, and you shall know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded, and as I prophesied there was a sound, and behold, a rattling, and the bones came together, bone to its bone. And I looked, and behold, there were sinews on them, and flesh had come upon them, and skin had covered them, but there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, prophesy to the breath, prophesy, son of man, and say to the breath, thus says the Lord God, come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe on these slain that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they lived and stood on their feet, an exceedingly great army. Then he said to me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Behold, they say, our bones are dried up, and our hope is lost. We are indeed cut off. Therefore, therefore prophesy and say to them, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I will open your graves and raise you from your graves, O my people, and I will bring you into the land of Israel. And you shall know that I am the Lord when I open your graves and raise you from your graves, O my people. And I will put my spirit within you, and you shall live, and I will place you in your own land. Then you shall know that I am the Lord. I have spoken, and I will do it, declares the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Our second scripture reading is from the New Testament, from the Gospel of John, chapter 20, verses 19 through 23. It's found on pages 852 and 853 of your pew Bibles. And again, let's listen to the word of God. On the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked, where the disciples were for fear of the Jews. Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord Jesus, and he said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you withhold forgiveness from any, it is withheld. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. May God add his blessing to the reading and to the hearing of this, his holy word. It's hard to imagine how hopeless the disciples must have felt on that day. Jesus was dead. Their leader, their rabbi, the center of their world, he had been executed, executed. For three years, they had followed him, they had studied him, they had apprenticed under him, and now, in a moment, he was gone, and not just gone, crucified. They crucified him. 
He was executed by the state in the most humiliating, most shameful way, a a method of execution that at that time was reserved for slaves and for the worst of criminals. So now what? Now what was going to happen? Would the authorities now come after them? Were they going to die the way that Jesus did in excruciating pain and incredible humiliation? And even if not, if they somehow survived, what were they going to do? What was left in their lives? How were they going to live without Jesus? Metaphorically speaking, the disciples were in Ezekiel's Valley of the Dry Bones, which we heard Janet read for us. It's a prophecy from centuries before the disciples detailing a vision that the prophet Ezekiel had. He tells us that the hand of the Lord was upon him and brought him out in the spirit of the Lord and set him down in the middle of a valley and it was full of bones. And the spirit led him around among them and behold, they were very many on the surface of the valley and behold, they were very dry. And God said to him, Son of man, can these bones live? And he answered, O Lord God, only you know that. In this vision, we have a metaphor for the people of Israel in Ezekiel's time. We're not going to go into all the details, but they had been conquered. They had been taken against their will to live in exile. They were living as refugees in a foreign land. Everything they knew, everything they loved, everything they cared for had been destroyed. And so they were left with this question, was there any life left? For them, for this broken, conquered, hurting people? Did they, the people of God, have any future at all? Can these bones live? As I said, the disciples were in that exact place, feeling the very same things. Was there any hope at all for the future? Maybe you've been there. Maybe you're there right now. Wondering, is there any hope at all in that horrible place where it feels like the, the rug has just been yanked out from under you, in that horrible place where in a moment your life is turned upside down and everything seems wrong and all hope seems lost and you wonder, can these bones live? Is there any hope for my dry, lifeless marriage? Is there any hope that I could ever conquer this addiction? Is there any hope that I will ever pay off this monstrous debt that is hanging over me? Is there any hope that I will ever get past this grief that I am feeling or that I'll ever get a hold of my anxiety or my depression or whatever it is? that is ruining my life? Is there any hope for a life that seems hopeless and aimless and worthless and useless? Well, let me tell you, my friends, the the good news of this day, of this highest of all high holy days, the good news of this day is, yes, there is hope. And yes, that hope comes through Jesus Christ, through our resurrected, living Lord. You see, the thing that sets the Christian faith apart is that we believe, we worship and serve a God who is alive, a living Lord. Contrary to what many people believe, the Christian faith is not about being good. The Christian faith is not about keeping the rules. The 
Christian faith is not about trying to earn your way into heaven through good behavior. A lot of people believe that's what Christianity is all about. A lot of people are living that belief out, but I can tell you, if you try to live that way, it's a horrible way to live. If you're trying to be a Christian and you think that being a Christian means being good and keeping rules, forgive me, but I'm going to point out the obvious, you're never going to be good enough. Trust me on that one. I've tried it. You're never going to be good enough. No matter how hard you try, nobody can be good all the time. Nobody can keep all the rules all the time. Nobody can ever be good enough for God because guess what? Evil lives within us. The Bible calls it sin. It is within each and every one of us. But the good news is Christianity isn't about trying to earn your way to God or trying to impress God with your good behavior or trying to store up enough points in order to make it to heaven. That's not what Christianity is about. Christianity is about having a relationship, a life-giving, saving relationship with God Himself. Our God is a personal God, a God who knows us, a God who loves us, a God who wants to be known and wants to be loved by us. And what this day is all about, the good news of this Easter day is that God has done all that is necessary to make that relationship possible. That included dying on the cross on Good Friday to take care of our sins, dying in our place, and then on the third day, on this day, rising again from the dead. He died to take care of our guilt. He rose again to take care of the problem of death. By dying, he's destroyed the power of death. By rising again, he's opened the way to eternal life so that we could have this saving, life-giving, eternal relationship with him. And folks, let me point out the obvious obvious here, a God who can do that, an all-powerful, all-knowing God who cares this much about us, whatever might be going on in your life today, this God has the power and cares enough about you to help you take care of whatever that problem may be. And that's incredibly good news. To believe in a God, to know a God, to have a relationship with a God who not only loves me, but wants to help me and has the power to do something to help me. That is incredibly good news. To know and have a relationship with that kind of God. Our hope is in Him. Our hope is in Jesus Christ. Our hope is in His love for us and His death and His resurrection. Our hope is in the fact that He's a personal, living Lord who cares for us. Our hope is in a God who is alive, a God who is invested in our lives, a God we can know, a God who can make our dry bones live. And we see in our Ezekiel passage that those bones come alive in two particular ways, through the Word of God and through the Holy Spirit. When God sets Ezekiel down in the middle of Death Valley, as I call it, He tells Ezekiel to do two things. First, to prophesy to the bones. Now, prophecy is simply speaking the word of the Lord. A human prophet is a person who speaks God's words to other human beings. And that word that he is given or she is given intrinsically in and of itself has power. We see this in the creation accounts when God, by His Word, simply speaks the world into being. God says, let there be light, and there was light. We see it also in the Gospels where we see Jesus healing people and working miracles and calming the storm and delivering people from evil and doing all kinds of things simply by speaking it. His Word has the power to make these things happen. 
And so in this passage, Ezekiel is told to prophesy, to speak this powerful word of God in the valley of the dry bones. And he says, I prophesied as I was commanded. And as I did so, there was a sound, behold, a rattling, and the bones came together bone to bone. And I looked, and behold, sinews came upon them, and flesh covered them, and skin covered them. But as yet, there was still no breath. It's amazing, simply by speaking the word of the Lord, this random pile, this assortment of dry, dry bones comes together and becomes an army of people. But something was missing. There was no life in them. There was no breath. That's where the Holy Spirit came into the picture. God told Ezekiel to prophesy to the wind or the breath in both Hebrew and Greek. The word for wind and breath and spirit is the same word. So Ezekiel speaks the word of the Lord the second time, and the wind blows, and the Holy Spirit comes, and God breathes the breath of life into this vast army of lifeless people, just as he breathed breath into Adam and Eve, just as he breathed breath into each one of us. His Holy Spirit comes and works through his word, and God concludes, this is what I will do for my people in distress. I will open your graves, I will raise you from your graves, and you will know that I am the Lord, and I will put my spirit within you, and you shall live. Then you shall know that I am the Lord. I have spoken, I will do it, declares the Lord. This is what God says to all of his people who are in despair, all of his people who feel that they are broken, all of those people who feel that they are living a life as dry, lifeless bones. God says, I will give you life. I will raise you to new life. I will give you all that you need, but all that you need, that life that you are longing for, comes through a relationship with me, and that relationship comes through hearing my word and receiving my Holy Spirit. And we see that same pattern playing out in our second reading with the disciples huddled together in fear in the upper room. They're terrified. They're bewildered. They're scared. They're despairing. And then all of a sudden, there's Jesus, the living, resurrected Jesus standing there among them. A locked door is no deterrent for him. There's their living Lord. There's their God, their friend, their rabbi. And he says to them, speaking the word of the Lord, peace be with you. Peace be with you. Now, just a reminder, in the Hebrew understanding, peace or shalom is more than a good feeling, and it's more than just not fighting with somebody. Peace means having wholeness and soundness and a goodness of life and a goodness in your relationships. Shalom means life is good. Life is as it was meant to be. This is what Jesus speaks to his terrified, despairing, grieving, hurting disciples. He speaks his peace, his shalom to them. And then when he had said this, he breathed on them and he said, receive the Holy Spirit. Jesus appears to his disciples, to his friends who feel that they are languishing in the valley of the dry bones, and he speaks his word of peace, and he gives them the gift of his Holy Spirit. He comes to them and gives them all that they need to have new life, real life, full life, life in all of its abundance, a life of shalom. And folks, the good news of this day is that this same Jesus... This God who knows us, this God who loves us, this God who has done all that is necessary for us to know and to love Him, this same God, this living Lord, comes to us when we are in the valley of the dry bones, and He offers us all that we need to have this good, rich, full, abundant 
life of peace and shalom. Because he offers us himself. Life only comes through him. He is the Lord of life. He is the one who came up with the whole idea of life in the first place. The one who made us. The one who made our world. So when we feel like our lives are dry and empty, when we feel like our lives are devoid of life, when we feel hopeless or senseless or useless or worthless, He's the only one who can turn that around, who can give us the peace and the joy that we are looking for. And that peace and that joy comes through knowing Him, through being in relationship with Him, through seeking Him through His Word, reading it and learning it and studying it and looking for Him, through receiving His Holy Spirit, His very presence in and with us and then keeping in step with that Spirit, allowing His Spirit to lead us in our lives. This joy and this peace comes through letting His Word and His Spirit lead us in a life of worship and service, following Jesus wherever He leads us to go. That's the only way to new life. That's the only way to get out of that valley of the dry bones and into life in all of its abundance. A new hairstyle isn't going to do that, folks. Isn't that what people do when they feel that their life is a little dry, when they feel that their life is going off the rails, when they feel stuck in a rut, when they feel like this isn't what I signed up for, they say, I need to reinvent myself. So they go, at least this is what they do in the movies and in the TV shows, they go and they get a new hairstyle and everything's better, right? Huh, right. New hairstyle isn't going to do that. A new job isn't going to do that. A new husband isn't going to do that. Or a new wife or a new partner or whatever. You can take up all the hobbies you want to take. You can start exercise classes. You can do all the side hustles that you want to do, but they're not going to give you life in all of its fullness either. You can change your name and get a facelift and move to a new city and try and start your life all over again, but I guarantee you, give it enough time and you will find yourself right back in the valley of the dry bones where you started because you won't be dealing with the real problem in your life. New life, the good life, the life that we all are searching for and seeking and longing for, life as it was meant to be lived, life in all of its fullness and abundance comes only through the one who made us the one who knit us together in our mother's wombs, the one who numbered all of our days before one of them came to be, the one who died for us, the one who rose again from the dead for us, the one who desires that we know him and love him as he knows and loves us, the one who wants us to be a part of his life for all eternity. Honestly, folks, has anybody done anything more than that for you? Has anybody done anything like that for you other than Jesus? And Scripture says the same Holy Spirit who raised Him from the dead, the same power that raised Jesus to new life on that first Easter, that same Holy Spirit and that same power is now offered to us to turn our lives upside down, to bring us back to life, to lead us out of the valley of the dry bones, that we might have life in Him. That's the good news that I want to make sure every single one of us gets before we leave this place today. So folks, let us seek Him. Let us seek to know Him and love Him and serve our living Lord. Let us seek Him in His Word. Let us seek to keep in step with His Holy Spirit, and let us receive this joy, this peace, this new life that He desires for us to have. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. To Him alone be the glory. Let us pray.
God, we thank you for your good news. We thank you for the life that you offer to us through Jesus Christ and through the power of your Holy Spirit. We pray that for each of us as we leave this place, Lord, that you would lead us each day to seek you in your word and to keep in step with your spirit. Help us to receive your joy and your peace and to live in this fullness and this abundance of life that you desire for each of us. Help us, Lord, as we go from this place to be a blessing, for we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.